Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the podcast. It is time for the Daily Dive for April 22nd, 2024. For some reason we're starting with Rebel Wilson. <laughs> she kind of got like a blind item in her book and everybody's trying to figure out who it could be. But she claimed a member of the royal family invited her to a drug-fueled orgy. And for whatever reason, everybody decided today to try and figure it out. But she said, I got thrown a last minute invite to a tech billionaire's party. The guy in who invited me, he's like 15th or 20th in line to the British throne, had said to my male friend, we need more girls. Then all of a sudden it's 2 a.m. and a guy comes out with a large tray piled with what looks like a ton of candy. I'm like, ooh, is that candy? And the guy holding the tray says, no, this is MDMA. And I turn to the screenwriter I've been talking with who says, oh, it's for the orgy. The orgies normally started about this time. I didn't try and figure out who it was. But if it's a tech billionaire who's 15th or 20th in line to the British throne, it shouldn't be that difficult to figure it out. I'm guessing she didn't give all the clues. Speaking of blinds, I kind of got to make this a blind a little bit. But I wasn't even really going to talk about it. But um, <laughs> because it still might not, it still might not happen. I'm, I'm hoping for them that they get back together. But there is this girlfriend of this comic actor who is a friend of mine. And I told her that she probably shouldn't be my friend while she's dating him. Because two other people who were my friends, who were also dating him, they split. And I said, you know, do you want to be like, in, you know, three? do you want me to be three for three in, these, in this situation? <laughs> and then it turns out that it's going to be a three for three situation. I hope not. I, I hope that they work things out. And since, because they, they might work things out, you know, I'm not going to mention any names. I wouldn't mention any names anyway. I'm not going to make it a blind, like, publicly. It's just for you guys. And I think probably Daisy Fuentes would really like to take some things back. <laughs> oh, she's had an interesting day. And you could tell she was she's the kind of person who's not going to back down. So there is um, this woman-owned business, Untamed Ego. And they make, you know, designer mugs, T-shirts, and stuff like that. Have about 600,000 followers on TikTok. And Daisy posted a photo with one of these untamed ego mugs. But photoshopped the logo of the brand off of it. Why would you do that? But followers, because obviously they have a lot of followers on social media, they identified and tagged the untamed ego account. And the owner made a, a video addressing the situation where she explained how Daisy photoshopped the logo off, making her small business less visible and tampering with the product. When Daisy has a business, Davy went to style, that promotes the empowerment of women. So when Daisy saw that her account was flooded with comments calling her out, she started insulting people. And the video is now deleted, and she, she has been active on Instagram, but hasn't addressed it. But <laughs> it's just like, it said like this. Um, this is what Daisy said. Forcing actual customers to promote your product forcefully is the dumbest marketing strategy ever. And sending your army of trolls to bully me for actually purchasing your product is the reason why I won't buy anything from you again. There are many companies like yours who don't bully their customers. I have a small company too. And if a customer wants to remove the tag after purchase, I don't bully them for it. I'm simply grateful to be supported by an actual purchase. You can learn from that. I'll remove the post since that's clearly what you want. And Untamed Ego said, thank you so much for posting my mug. Just curious why you removed the logo of my artwork. And Daisy tags a bunch of people. Well, this is a first. I posted something because I obviously liked it and wanted to share. I didn't remove anything. Yes, she did. With that said, I promote what I want and how I want, especially products I buy. All these idiots who obviously work for this company reprimanding me in my account because I didn't promote something I bought. The way they think I should only accomplish the removal of such posts and I will not purchase from this company again. You all need to learn how social media works. Basically, you post what you want and how you want. I will do a different post letting everyone know how pushy, controlling, 
and annoying innocently posting this as Ben, still hasn't done that, you're all a bunch of super judgy, annoying bullies. How about you mind your own business? I never refuse to acknowledge a mug manufacturer. Do you publicly acknowledge everything you purchase? Actually, no one cares what you do, and you shouldn't go policing other people's accounts. You're annoying AF. Bye. And a user replied to Daisy, you posted five weeks ago. Surround yourself with women who will mention your name in a room full of opportunities. Yet you took the time to remove the brand name on the mug you posted from a female business owner. Hashtag practice what you preach. And Daisy said, no one forces anyone to promote anything. Get a life. And then said, hey, how about you F off? You don't get to come to my account and accuse me of stupid stuff. I promote what I want and how I want. You're free to do the same. Get a life, asshole. Well, I wonder what she says to Richard Marks. <laughs> but how rare is it, first of all, that a celebrity goes off like that? I get it, right? You buy it. You can do what you want. What if, what if she bought it and smashed it right on camera? You know, just, oh, I bought this. I'm just going to smash it. Is there an obligation to show the logo? Is she, you know, getting called out? I understand I, it, because of what she had said about surround yourself with women who will mention your name <clears throat> in a room full of opportunities. So obviously untamed ego shouldn't associate themselves with Daisy. A quick note that I saw, and I don't know if it's Ariana Maddox trying to get more money out of Bravo, but she goes, oh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be back for another season. I know it has to feel right. What she's really trying to decide is, okay, will I keep getting opportunities like Chicago and this other stuff? If I don't do Vanderpump Rules, do I need to be on it to keep getting these three, four, five hundred thousand dollar paychecks? Because I'm forty something or whatever, and I don't want to pretend I work in a bar. <laughs> but it made me think, what are the ratings like this year? Because remember last year when I I talked about the ratings and I said, oh, on March 1st, 2023, they were at a season low, 648,000 viewers. And then the year before it had averaged 678,000 with like a 0.23 share in the 18 to 49 demo. So it was headed down because March 1st was the, the lowest of that season. And that when I did that ratings episode where I was talking about it, we knew the news of the affair and stuff and I said, well, here you go. Everybody's going to watch it. It took two weeks. And two weeks later, it doubled the people, doubled the 1849 demo state all through the season. The reunion episodes averaged nearly 2 million people and literally almost a 1% share in 18 to 49. But you get to season 11. You don't have the big things, but everybody's like, oh, well, we should watch the first episode because maybe there'll be something exciting happening. So the first episode of the year... They had 1.4 million viewers and a 0.55 share in 18 to 49. Pretty good. Keep that up all year. You got yourself a really good base. By this last week, they've dropped off to 917,000. They're down a half a million. And they're down to a 0.28 share in 18 to 49, which is where they basically were last year at this time, at least with that share. People have stopped watching it in the 18 to 49. They obviously, if they're at a 0.28 share with 917,000, last year they were 0.23 with 678. You have a lot more older people watching or a lot younger people and advertisers don't really care about them. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens over the course of the next few weeks. Can the, is it going to keep dropping? Is it going to go down to the 600,000 level? And to give you kind of a point of reference, like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills generally averages about 1.1 million. And their share, though, of 18 to 49 is generally about 0 0.25, 0 0.3. They skew much older. But staying in that same kind of universe, I suppose, the Valley, it's very interesting because Michelle Lally says that she's dating someone amazing and that she's moved out of her house with Jesse and says, oh, we're not going to reconcile at all. We were hopefully maybe just become friends at some point. But she wouldn't say who the new boyfriend is. Pretty sure it's Aaron Nossler, but not 100% sure. But one of the things, also kind of a blind item, 
because she was talking earlier about the rumors that she had cheated on Jesse. It was like an episode earlier this month. And Jackson and Luke had hinted at Michelle being unfaithful. And Luke claimed he knew something that could end Jesse and Michelle's marriage, which may have happened behind the scenes. And Jax was talking about Michelle's close bond with a mystery director. Said Michelle always claims she doesn't know who famous people are, but she was going on with that director. She was going out with him for a couple of days straight. She goes to the Chateau Marmont every day from her house, and she happened to meet him at the pool. And I saw, you know, it's just, he said it like day after day after day. And Jesse was like, oh, it's because of my real estate. And everybody, for some reason, guessed Quentin Tarantino. But he's, yes, when he's in L.A. Chateau, but most of the time he's in, like, Israel with his wife and kids. My best guess is that it's Michael Bay, who also lives at Chateau most of the time. That's my guess. So, now... There's not really a way to transition from the Valley into Blair Witch. But I feel for Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams. Because remember, I talked about it a week and a half ago or so. <clears throat> Lionsgate and Blumhouse said, oh, we're going to revive the franchise with the new movie. And everybody's kind of pretty excited about it. You know, and, and when they did, when they announced it at CinemaCon, what did they do? They used a picture of Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams. So they were rightfully upset. And they released a public letter to Lionsgate this weekend asking for more robust compensation for their work, as well as meaningful consultation on any future Blair Witch projects that use their names or likenesses. Do not forget, this is very important. Heather Donahue, Joshua Leonard, and Michael Williams used their real names as the characters in Blair Witch. It wasn't, you know, Nancy, Ted, and Donald. They used their real names. So, you know, Lionsgate didn't produce or distribute the original film. It acquired the property back in 2003 when they bought Artisan Entertainment. Leonard, Joshua Leonard, said no one had contacted him or his co-stars about the project in advance. At this point, it's 25 years of disrespect from the folks who pocketed the lion's share, pun intended, of the profits from our work. And that feels both icky and classless. And Leonard said the actors, they shot and they improvised the movie on a week and a week. And they used their real names. Here's where things get really, really sketchy. Is that... They're young, right? 1999, they're barely starting out. And each of them got $300,000 from a buyout of their ownership points in the film. If they had kept it, they would have got millions and millions of dollars. But they're barely making rent. Oh, here's $300,000. Yeah, I made $250 million. And in 2002, they did sue Artisan Entertainment for using their names and likenesses in the sequel, Book of Shadows. And Donahue, by the way, goes by um, Ray Hans now. That they want retroactive and future residual payments, equivalent to the sum they would have been allotted through SAG-AFTRA. They weren't in the union when they did the movie. They didn't have legal representation when they did the movie. And they want consultation on any future Blair Witch reboot, sequel, prequel, toy, game, ride, escape room, in which one could reasonably assume that Heather, Michael, and Josh's names and or likenesses will be associated with it. You know, this cast, they did it. They said, as the literal faces of what has become a franchise, likenesses, voices, and real names are inseparably tied to the Blair Witch Project. So, and the original filmmakers totally on board with the three actors. Not on board, at least right now, but honestly, they've called it quits 15 times already. So Big Ed Brown and Liz Woods probably will get back together. Oh, we're doing another season. You guys need $300,000 each? Yeah, come on back. 
I mean, how many times they have they been on 90 Day Fiance and the iterations of it? They called it quits for the 15th time yesterday. 15 times. And Ed said, well, you know, the move to Arkansas, it didn't improve our relationship. Gave him a new perspective. We knew this was coming. I mean, Ed said last night, I think Liz actually is waiting for me to call her up and say, I'm sorry, like it's always been. I call, I apologize, okay, and we move on, and that's how the last 14 breakups have been. But we knew it was coming because of the taco pasta. And there was this argument in front of Ed's family. And Ed gave Liz's daughter a plate of his signature taco pasta. But Liz said Riley's dish was just way too spicy for her, and Ed pretty much told her to stop being a baby. And Liz called him out on it, said I didn't appreciate it. And then he attacked me back saying, look at you, you're crazy and everything like that. So we're arguing in front of his family. Instead of trying to talk things out, Ed took off. And she said after the taco pasta, with this blow up, it's not like Ed tried to talk me through it or anything like that. It's just that Ed doesn't like being pulled into a corner or having to listen how he messes up. And Ed said, what makes this breakup different is that this is not about anger. I'm not angry at Liz. I'm just realizing that we're not meant to be together. I'm at a different stage in my life, and I can see clearly that it's not going to work, that Liz needs to go live her life, and I need to live mine. Well, you're making taco pasta. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I know that they have to be careful on social media, but Liz has been back in California, right? Everybody's seen her, you know, in in Carlsbad and San Diego and stuff like that. So obviously Ed's not there. It appears just to be Liz and her daughter. But Liz said, you know, Ed was just gone. And then I received a text message from the guy who's going to marry us telling me how sorry he was that the wedding was called off. Ed canceled our wedding without even telling me. The only thing I can think of is Ed's getting cold feet and he never actually really wanted to get married because although we've been the best we've ever been, we still have our issues. I don't think I could have shown this man any more effort that he means everything to me. Called him a coward and a weakling. (sighs) I'm not holding out hope that there's going to be another get together. But at some point, you just, can we find a different couple for the show? Let's just let Big Ed go. Let him live in Arkansas. I have a heart attack in a couple of years. I don't know. Maybe we find somebody different for Liz. Maybe we do it like that. Sometimes two halves don't go together, as a Florida couple found out. Because a Florida couple, and this is Florida being Florida, allegedly tried to... Oh, this kills me. They taped together two halves of a scratch-off ticket and tried to pass it off as a million-dollar winner. 36-year-old Kira Lee Enders went to the Florida Lottery's Pensacola office and said, I won a million-dollar prize from the 500 times the cash scratch-off ticket. And Sheriff's deputies in an affidavit said, the ticket had obvious alterations, is crudely pieced together from two separate actual scratch-off tickets. They said that Enders ripped the two tickets, which were non-winners, and put them together to make it look like she had a winning ticket. And she wrote her full name and address on the ticket and signed it under the penalty of perjury. So the Florida Lottery agents investigating, the sheriff's office. So they call in Enders and her boyfriend, a guy named Dakota Jones. <clears throat> they detained them when they arrived, separated them. And Enders told the police she realized she had the winner when she scratched off the ticket at her home but couldn't remember where she bought it. Yeah, because you're buying so many of them. She tried to go to three different businesses to have the ticket scanned but was unsuccessful. But she planned on sharing the winnings with Dakota. Detectives then asked her how the ticket got ripped. And she said, well, it got wet in the rain and I tried to scratch it off before it was dry so it it tore. And then she taped the ticket herself. And then the detective said, hey, look, this is a non-winning ticket made into a winning ticket. And what do you think her response was? What? They don't go together? <laughs> she said that the two pieces went together. 
And she didn't intentionally commit any fraud because doing so would be dumb, and that's how you go to jail. But she also said their boyfriend had nothing to do with the ticket. <clears throat> and Dakota said that he thought Anders bought the tickets at a Win dixie near their house, and they got wet. So she took a blow dryer to dry them. And Jones advised that he told Enders that she shouldn't have put tape on the ticket because it looks like she altered it. Jones stated he told Enders that they weren't going to accept that ticket because it looks jank. But the front desk told them that a damaged ticket takes longer because it has to go through security. Jones stated that they're honest people and they aren't into fraud. But then Jones changed his story. He said that he and Enders were walking near their house when they saw half of a torn ticket on the ground and then walked about 50 yards and found another half. And then Enders taped together the ticket, and it appeared that they won a million bucks. He also said that he and Enders don't really play the lottery, which contradicted what his girlfriend told detectives. So then the detectives went back to Enders to say, hey, <clears throat> your boyfriend told a completely different story about how they got the tickets. She goes, no, no, we bought the tickets. Well, they were charged with forgery, altering of a lottery ticket with intent to defraud, and grand theft in the first degree of $100,000 or more. And they have a court date scheduled for May 10th. Well, somebody who was also in court today was Nancy Gonzalez. Oh, Nancy Gonzalez. Went, go, let's go back to September of 2023. And you guys know Nancy Gonzalez because her bags were everywhere in the early aughts. Everywhere. Sex in the City, Victoria Beckham used to, you know, carry them all the time. But back in September, she was extradited to the U.S. on conspiracy and smuggling charges related to the U.S., to the U.S., to the use of endangered species in her luxury purse lines. So back in September, she signed extradition papers and she went from Bogota to Florida. And Gonzalez and her employees and co-defendants were indicted back in April of 2022 by federal prosecutors in Florida on conspiracy and smuggling charges. Because between 2016 and 2019, Gonzalez used mules to smuggle over 200 python and caiman skin purses and handbags into the U.S. without a permit, which is in violation of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna in Florida. And if questioned by customs agents about paperwork for the bags, the mules were instructed to say they were gifts for relatives. Instead, the bags were displayed by Gonzalez's company at a showroom in New York City, hawked to department stores, $2,000 a bag. And when she was arrested in her home city of Cali, Colombia, she was reportedly in possession of several python skin handbags and a soccer ball made of caiman skin. And Colombian police and European authorities also found that she illegally acquired endangered animal skins, including snakes and deer, with the intention of making them into bags. Nobody could tell kind of what species of python and caiman skin she had. And it's very interesting because in Asia, they basically have these pseudo breeding facilities. Um, they collect them in the wild and they pretend that they are breeding them. And it sounds like, okay, first of all, she faced 25 years behind bars and a $500,000 fine. But today she was sentenced to 18 months in jail. She pleaded guilty. And lawyers for Gonzalez sought leniency, f describing her journey as a divorced single mom of two children who designed belts on a home sewing machine in Cali, Colombia, to a fashion icon. And that she had already paid dearly for her crimes. The company she built, which once employed 300 mostly female employees, declared bankruptcy and stopped operating after her arrest. And that only 1% of the merchandise she imported in the U.S. lacked the proper authorization and were samples mostly for New York Fashion Week. And Gonzalez addressed the court, <clears throat> said she deeply regretted not meticulously complying with U.S. laws, and their only wish was to hug once more her 103-year-old mother. From the bottom of my heart, I apologize to the United States of America. I never intended to offend a country to which I owe immense gratitude. Under pressure, I made poor decisions. Prosecutors said that she acquired great wealth and an opulent lifestyle, which contrasted with the courier she recruited to smuggle her merchandise. Her mission turned into producing felons. She tried to rewrite the law for herself to do it her way. So ahead of important fashion events, she would recruit as many as 40 passengers to carry four designer handbags each on commercial flights. And she smuggled goods that fetched as much as $2 million. And her attorney said, no, each skin cost about 140 bucks. 
Now, here's the thing, is that she really kind of screwed herself. Like, she wasn't going to be able to sell them in California or anything, no matter what. But all the things, like all the skins that she was doing, at least it appears from what I've read that they, they were all bred in captivity. And if they're bred in captivity, you can export them, you can import them, you can do whatever you want. You just have to get the proper authorizations. And that way it's like, okay, these are not endangered or threatened wildlife species. These are ones that were bred in captivity. And she had been warned back in 2016 and 2017 against, hey, you got to get the authorizations. So she could have got the authorizations. It's not like she was, at least from what I understand and what I've read from the court filings, that she was using wild animals like happens in Asia. She was using bred in captivity ones. Now, prosecutors said, hey, we want 30 to 37 months. But the judge said, look, she spent 14 months in a Colombian prison awaiting extradition. That was rough. So she has been free on bond. She continues to be free on bond. And she has to report for her sentencing on June 6th. So I just, like I said, the trade in the skins, it was not prohibited. All she needed to do was fill out some paperwork. That's it. It, it doesn't sound honestly like even the stuff like getting the, these couriers and stuff. It just, she needed to fill out the paperwork. So um, I think it was yesterday in your turn. I think it was yesterday. It might have been Saturday. But I was... I always say on the weekend, your turns, you know, sponsored by whoever. And I don't know why it popped into my head, but I was like, I wonder how many people have done the voice of Captain Crunch. And it's going to be sponsored by the 14 voices that did Captain Crunch or something like that. So I went and I was trying to find out how many voices had played Captain Crunch. And the next thing I learned was that the guy who created Captain Crunch also created the Mary Tyler Moore Show and the Munsters, won a bunch of Emmys, was nominated for an Academy Award. I'm like, okay, how did I not know this? And the guy's name's Alan Burns. Like I said, he won multiple Emmys, nominated for an Academy Award. And he's mostly known as the co-creator of My Mother the Car, the Mary Tyler Moore Show. But before that, he was a young writer and an animator working for Jay Ward. And Jay Ward did like Crusader Rabbit and the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. But Burns had received a partial scholarship to study architecture at the University of Oregon. But he left school in 1955, moves to Los Angeles, and he lands a job as an NBC page. <clears throat> and he was asked once in an interview, um, what convinced this new employer to hire you? And the, he said, the interviewer said, you said you were 42 long, right? Well, that's the only uniform we have available right now. Somebody just quit. And he said, the reason I'm in show business, literally, is because I'm a 42 long. That is the truth. So he tried to submit jokes to The Tonight Show and to comedians like George Goebel and Jonathan Winters. Nobody was interested. And then he read scripts as part of a new NBC comedy writing development program. He got laid off. Then went and worked as a writer for the game show Truth or Consequences. And that lasted about a month. And he spent a couple of years like writing jokes and drawing cartoons for greeting card companies. And he puts together a portfolio of his work. And he went to Jay Ward's offices on Sunset Boulevard without an appointment. <clears throat> and as Burns was trying to talk his way into a meeting with Ward, the producer happened to walk by. He looks at all my stuff, starts chuckling and says, when do you want to start? And he began by working on promotional flyers for Rocky and his friends in the Bullwinkle show, then graduated to Fractured Fairy Tales, and he got paid 215 bucks a week. And he'd been working there a bit, and he gets a call from Ward, who was on vacation. This is 1962. And Ward had forgotten that he'd scheduled a meeting with some Chicago-based advertising executives working for Quaker Oats. And they wanted to build a campaign around a new cereal. And Ward asked Burns to take a stab at it. But you need to try some cereal first. And Ward kept it in a bag in his office. 
Burns says, I tasted it and it tasted like it was going to shred my mouth. It was so crunchy. And I called Jay back and I said, I think I've got a tagline. It's not, it stays crunchy even in milk. It would be stays crunchy even in hydrochloric acid. This stuff is going to shred children's mouth all over America. He wasn't wrong, was he? <laughs> but Ward said, hey, just whip something together. <laughs> so Burns drew up a Horatio Hornblower figure he named Captain Crunch and a bunch of supporting characters. That could be for television commercials or cartoons. And Burns was the one who ended up pitching the idea to the ad executives, who thought it was funny. But they wanted to go talk to the other animation houses, including like Hanna-Barbera. But a month, a month later, Burns learned that J. Ward Productions had successfully sold the idea to Quaker Oats. And Burns got a bonus. He said, Quaker Oats got millions and millions and millions from Captain Crunch. I got a thousand bucks. That's all he got. For creating Captain Crunch, he got a thousand dollars. Think about that. But he and Chris Hayward, who was a fellow writer for J. Ward, they um, pitched an idea for um, a half-hour sitcom, loosely inspired by the Addams Family cartoons in The New Yorker. And it went on to become The Munsters. And they didn't know, but they had pitched their idea for The Munsters to an agent who was unscrupulous. And then fed that idea to writers Norm Liebman and Ed Haas at Universal. Um, and so when Burns and Hayward learned about the comedy about a family of monsters in the production at CBS, they petitioned the WGA and got the rightful credit as the creators of it. And then, um, you know, the two also did My Mother the Car and later became writers and story consultants on Get Smart, but it was towards the end of the Get Smart run. And then Grant Tinker, who was at CBS, he said, hey, Burns, why don't you work with this guy named James L. Brooks? I saw that you guys did some really good stuff on Room 222. And Brooks had created it. And Brooks had also written spec scripts for My Mother the Car. But Grant Tinker, who was married to Mary Tyler Moore at the time, you know, he and Mary were looking around for somebody to write a pilot and come up with a concept for her show, which had a 13-episode commitment on CBS. And Burns said, and he chose us. And that, to me, was somewhat amazing. I mean, we had credits, and they were pretty good, but still. And the original concept had um, Mary Tyler Moore's Mary Richards portraying a divorcee, working as a stringer for a Hollywood columnist. And Burns said no one had done a show about someone being divorced. And Tinker and Mary Tyler Moore loved the idea. Both had been divorced. But CBS executives had a corporate heart attack when they heard what the writers had in mind. According to Burns, the CBS exec told them, our research shows us there are four things American television audiences do not like. New Yorkers, Jewish people, people with mustaches, and divorce. So in the next couple of weeks, we came up with the idea of doing it in a newsroom. Jim had worked in a newsroom in New York, that's James Brooks, and said, I always thought it was a great place for comedy. And they also made Mary a jilted woman who moves to Minneapolis after a broken engagement. So a single independent female in the workplace becomes an icon for the feminist movement. Ran for seven seasons. Collected 29 Emmys, which was then a record. And Burns and Brooks won five trophies. And the last two were for outstanding comedy series and for writing. And mother, my mother, the car, which had Jerry Van Dyke, um, not so good, just 30 episodes. And... <laughs> Burns says, you know, it's nice to know that some people think the Mary Tyler Moore show is one of the better shows of all time, and that I also did one show that everyone is sure of is the worst. You can also thank Alan Burns for discovering Jim Carrey. Yes. Burns saw Carrey performing stand-up at a comedy club in West Hollywood and hired him to star as a cartoonist in the 1984 sitcom he had created, The Duck Factory. And Burns based the show on his experiences working for Ward. And like I said, he got nominated for an Academy Award for writing a movie that had um, Lawrence Olivier and Diane Lane in it. He also wrote Butch and Sundance in the early days. He wrote the Christy McNichol comedy, Just the Way You Are, and wrote and directed Just Between Friends with Mary Tyler Moore. And he died in 2021. But you never know what you're going to learn. Just Googling how many people have been the voice of Captain Crunch. And I still don't know the answer. All right, the blind items revealed from Saturday. The first one was from April 12th. The foreign-born singer might have had a cause of death listed as cardiac arrest, but it was an overdose, and that's Sinead O'Connor. 
Number two was from April 12th. This A-list pro athlete has been everywhere the past year. Those close to him are worrying he is drinking too much. And that's Travis Kelsey. Number three was from April 12th. This editor has informed the powers that be that if anyone touches her magazine, they should expect all kinds of things to come out about said powers that be. And that's Anna Wintour, Vogue, and Condé Nast. Number four is from April 13th. They don't test for everything, but even though the permanent A-list athlete looked like he had coke jaw, I'm guessing he isn't doing coke. And that's Tiger Woods. Sunday, um, number one was from April 13th. The former manager turned reality star, turned talk show host, turned celebrity, knows after what she said, she isn't going to get hired for anything again. So it's just going scorched earth and looking very petty doing so. And that's Sharon Osbourne. Number two is also from April 13th. Speaking of petty, this not used denim foreign group is really petty for going after a tiny YouTube account that just calls out all the BS of the K-pop groups and companies. That is New Jeans. Number three is from April 14th. After the events of earlier this weekend, I'm sure the A-minus list celebrity offspring was inundated with texts from her father and her church minders about the A-minus lister's husband and his relationship with another offspring. And it's Haley Baldwin Bieber, Stephen Baldwin, Justin Bieber, and Jaden Smith. Number four was from April 14th. Speaking of the A-plus list singer, her people really would like to be in charge of her boyfriend's social media so he doesn't embarrass the singer. And that is Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Today's blind items revealed, um, number one was from April 14th. The one named north of the border singer slash DJ always had someone get everything ready for her. This time she got into a fight about payment and they walked and her set sucked. And that's Grimes. Number two is from April 15th. Apparently the barely there celebrity offspring who dates 40 years her senior has a different definition of what drugs are than you or me because she's definitely using drugs. And that is Aoki Lee Simmons. Number three is from April 15th. The only reason the illiterate one and her husband are staying in the resort and not mooching off some poor sap is because the streaming service is paying the bill. And that's Meghan Markle, Prince Harry, and Netflix. Number four is from April 15th. I don't know why anyone's shocked the reunion of a group nearly a decade in the making got a bigger crowd than Friday night's headliner. They have more hits, and their lead singer has been in our face for decades. The reuniting group also got paid more, although don't tell the headliner. And it's no doubt Gwen Stefani, Lana Del Rey, and Coachella. Number five, from April 15th. At one point during this recent Northeast con, this A-minus list actress who starred on an iconic show in its reboot had to send people out to come to her table. No one wanted to meet her. Five years ago, she would have thought cons were beneath her, and now she can't even get anyone to pay money to get a photo with her. And that's Deborah Messing, Steel City Con, and Will and & Grace. And that is it for this one, you guys. I will talk to you 